Bait guitars are nothing new. They've been around for ages. The most common ones you'll find are Chibsons, Chinese made Gibsons that are just completely and totally fake. They tend to be passable from a distance, but once you got them up close, it's pretty easy to tell that they're not the real deal. Today though, I want to look at the guitars that were made to fool the experts. If you're in the secondhand market for PRSs, Gibsons, Hamers, Kramers, old handmade BC Riches and vintage Gibsons, you need to be aware of this. There's thousands out there right now. You might own one. You might have paid top dollar for it thinking that it was real. And they're all the product of one man. What you see here is a uh, stock Gibson Les Paul that we are planning to convert to one of our conversions. We are now going to hand carve this body. Now I know what you're thinking. What the hell is even that? That was Ed Roman, self-proclaimed guitar king of Las Vegas, doing one of the many controversial things he did with guitars. And just a word of warning, if those images disturbed you, you're really not gonna like what he did to an original 1958 Gibson Flying V or a low serial number PRS. So why was he hacking away at that Les Paul? And why did they shoot another? Pretty good questions, but I've got an even better one. Why aren't you subscribed yet? Over 60% of viewers aren't subscribed, so do me a favor and click that subscribe button. Okay, so this story revolves around the idea of modification. Modification is an important part of the guitar industry. It probably makes up about half of the industry. Without it, there would be no pickup companies, no replacement tuners, no refrets, no nothing. You're allowed to modify your guitar if you own it. You should be allowed, you own it. But there is a gray area. How far can you go with the modifications until that guitar isn't even that guitar anymore? And that grey area is where Roman operated in. Ed Roman was a guitar salesman, and at one point he owned the largest guitar store in the world, stocking over 7,000 guitars. There was even a reality TV show in the works at one point, the pilot of which can be found on YouTube, and it's every bit of a reality TV show that you would expect. I said f***ing mahogany! Where Ed got global attention though was through his website. He had a vast site full of information about guitars and guitar brands when no one else did. This was old school, we're talking dial-up internet days. Contradictions are plentiful on the site and it often feels that if Ed had something for sale, then it was the best thing ever, but if he didn't have it for sale, then it was the worst thing imaginable and you definitely didn't want it. With all that said, it was Ed's practice of guitar conversions and replications of guitars that got him in trouble with some guitar brands, and it's some wild stuff. In one of the last interviews he did before his death in 2011, Ed explained why he started pulling guitars apart. I built incredibly nice motorcycles, but people take their motorcycles apart every couple of years and redo them. So it's just normal. So when I got into the guitar business, that's what I did. I started taking guitars apart. And that was sacrilegious. Sacrilegious in this silly backwards business. It's very backwards, very, very backwards. People, the people in this business are, are not forward thinkers. They're, they're, they don't think ahead, they think back. In other words, Vintage guitars, that whole that whole thing. I mean, we used to take Harleys and, and convert them to something cool, you know. And then when I started taking guitars and converting them to something cool, people would go, "You can't do that. That's sacrilege." The thing is, there's a difference between riding a Harley and riding a bike with Harley handlebars. And that's how I would describe some of the things that Ed was doing with guitars. They would take a guitar, for example, a Gibson Les Paul, rip the neck out of it and put that into a new body that they made. We take a customer's Les Paul and we keep the neck and waste the body and uh, wind up with something that looks like this on a Les Paul. Now the obvious question is why? This is more work than just building a guitar from scratch. Why not just do that? Well, there are some reasons listed on the website. To fix the guitar after some idiot damaged it or put a tremolo on it. Okay, that's kind of like a restoration and we'll be looking at some of the Roman restorations in, in a second. But just building a brand new body for a guitar is not restoring it, it's just replacing the body. To make it sound better. Totally subjective. To make it unique. Sure, 
but if you're looking for a unique guitar, you wouldn't start off with a Gibson Les Paul. To make your guitar look much better, a little bit more subjective, but more quilty or flamed top might make your guitar look better, but it's still not the same guitar, it's a totally new body. If you wanted your guitar to look like that, again, why not just build a new one from scratch with a super quilted or flame top? None of those reasons stand out to me to be particularly compelling, but there is one last reason. To make your guitar infinitely more saleable for much more money, with four, no five, exclamation marks. And here's why I think that might just be the main reason. This custom made Ed Roman guitar has only the original neck and headstock overlay. Even the fingerboard and the frets are replaced. This way the serial number stays intact. So it's an entirely new guitar, only the wood of the neck is the same. And the only reason they kept that is so they could keep the serial number. Why would you keep the serial number? For resale value. So that no one thinks that your guitar is fake even though it's definitely not a Gibson. Most of it's an Ed Roman. And by the way, they didn't just do this to Gibson Les Paul standards either. In 1997, Ed Roman did over 150 Gibson retops, including many old ones. Yes, we have done original 58s and 59s also. They did that to 59s. And we haven't even started on what they were doing to vintage instruments. We'll get there. But if you're still not convinced that the main reason that this was being done was to increase the uh, money-making potential of these instruments, how's about this? Dealers, send me all your broken Les Pauls. Come on. On, you've got them in the back packed away, they are currently worthless. I will send it back to you like new, but customized to where you will be able to get far more for it. I will never show any job done for any dealer on my website. I have done Les Pauls, PRSs, Hamers, etc. for over 120 dealers in the US alone. If this is to be believed, over 120 dealers in the US have been selling broken guitars for more than what they would be new sketchy behavior. But that was just the Gibsons, how about we uh, look at some of the PRS's that they were working on. They did a whole bunch of them. Retopped in Ed Roman's custom shop. It is extremely rare that we will retop a 22 fret model, you can't polish a turd. <laughs> to be clear, 22 fret guitars are not turds. Bonnie Pink used to be a really sought after colour. People would pay several thousand extra just for the colour. We retopped at least 12 PRS guitars and refinished them in pink. Naturally, we went inside and changed the colour markings so that it would look original. This is faking a guitar. Yeah, at one point it was an original PRS guitar, but they've replaced the body or they've replaced the top. They've refinished it and made it seem as if it was an original in that colour specifically for resale. There's no reason that you would change the inside inner markings to make it look like it's an original if it wasn't for resale. PRS serial number 78. The problem. Restore this guitar to the original. So not even Paul Reed Smith himself could tell it was restored. This early PRS guitar, serial number 78, had been cut to accommodate a Floyd Rose tremolo. Ouch. Otherwise this guitar was in dead mint condition. If you look closely you can see the enlarged tremolo cavity. So this guitar is a prime candidate for restoration work. There's only one problem with it, the rest of it is mint. So all you'd really have to do is cut a block of mahogany to fit in where that tremolo cavity was, glue that in, reroute it and then colour match it to the rest of the body and that would be a restoration. What do we think uh, Roman did for this one? Solution! Completely remove the original PRS neck from the body, rebuild with an exact replica body, don't glue it back together but instead use bolts. <sighs> Notice the seafoam green paint in the truss rod cavity. I left this on purpose. However, if I ever decide to sell this, it would be relatively simple for some unscrupulous person to remove the seafoam green paint and of course pass it off as an original. If I was doing the job for a customer, I would normally remove it anyway. This is why you need to be aware of all this stuff on the second hand market. So here's the guitar after all the work was finished, and he says, Okay, this guitar isn't technically original. Technically original? It triggers broom. This old broom has had 17 new heads and 14 new handles in its time. How the hell can it be the same bloody broom? Well, here's a picture of it. What more proof do you need? Okay, let's get on to the vintage guitars, shall we? In this section of the website, Ed tells us some of the repairs he's done on uh, some vintage instruments. Let's start with the 1958 Gibson Flying V. The story goes like this. The owner of the guitar was not a fan of Ed Roman's restoration work. Understandable. That was until his girlfriend stepped on the cable of the guitar and it broke out a chunk of the top of the guitar. He brought the guitar to Ed and paid him to keep it anonymous. Ed told him that if he could see the repair when he was done, 
he wouldn't charge him for it. When he got the guitar back, he looked over it and couldn't find the repair job. And Ed tells us how he did it. They cut the guitar in half and built an entirely new half of the V. So this 58 is half of 58. So now there is an original Gibson 1958 Flying V out there that's half fake. How about those extra tuner holes that were in every single old guitar in 1988? Where did they go? I'm not guessing on this one, my shop removes them. How do we remove them you ask? You cannot plug them because the grain runs north to south if you plug them and they will show even if you refinish the guitar within 6 months. This will expose your refinishing and turn you into a crook if you get caught. So how do you not be a crook? Simple. The only way to fix this problem is to remove the neck completely and replace the entire neck with a brand new piece of presumably aged mahogany. Remove the overlay on the old neck and laminate it to the new neck, thus preserving all the old logos and decals. Then the neck gets carefully refinished and aged. Affix the original tuners and now your guitar is perfectly original. I wonder how many rich doctors and real estate agents that have those guitars in their collection, all while assuming their guitar is the real thing. I hate to burst your bubble, but I have done a large number of those jobs. I'm currently charging $3,500 to do this. For that price, I will sign a non-disclosure statement, promising never to reveal to anyone that this work was performed on your guitar. Sketchy. Now if you search up things like Ed Roman fake, Ed Roman counterfeit, you don't really find much on the website. You do find articles like the one I'm going to show you now where Ed Roman condemns fakes and counterfeit guitars when it affects him. Be aware and be informed. Recently, a customer tried to buy a JFrog neck from me, JFrog being an Ed Roman owned brand. He had already purchased a JFrog Glock 22. It was his intention to put the JFrog neck on his ESP and therefore in effect create a JFrog guitar. Of course, I didn't sell him the neck, but he did purchase another JFrog Glock 22. Therein lies the potential for at least two counterfeits. Fear faked frogs. So yes, a very clear stance on fake and counterfeit guitars. But remember when I told you that there were contradictions across the website? Well, it depends on where you look. When he's talking about making any guitar, it's a very different stance. We are a custom shop and we offer custom guitars. We will build you anything you want. We get criticised for some of the copies we make. Some people feel that we should not make guitars for people that they could pass off as original antiques. We have come under fire by people. We have been insulted and defamed us. We will continue to make whatever our customers are willing to pay to have built. What our customer wants to do with it is his business. A uh, very different stance there. Now there is a section of Ed's website which is no longer accessible. Uh, it's been removed off. The internet but nothing is ever fully removed so it's just a trip to the way back machine and we can find the ed roman fabulous fakes page where it's just a catalog of all the fake guitars that they make now remember he wouldn't sell a j frog neck to a customer in fear that they might put that neck onto a different body thus creating a counterfeit these guitars are made using the original kramer necks from the early 80s that were never cut ed roman has acquired several crates of the original necks from a former kramer executive we do this treatment to many stock ibanez guitars these two are not Ibanez guitars. We make them up from scratch. Fakes. As far as the eye can see. Now you could spend hours talking about Ed Roman and going on the Ed Roman website, so let's finish this video up with the BC Rich story. If there's one group of people that really, really are open about their dislike of Roman, that's the BC Rich fan base, and it's not for no reason. Ed Roman sold a lot of BC Rich guitars. At one point, he was the biggest BC Rich dealer in the world. It's just not all of the BC Riches he sold were actually BC Riches. Of course, they did what they were doing with Les Pauls. They did the BC Rich conversions. And a lot of people who own these would rather have them look like they were the original BC Riches made in California. This guitar started out almost identical to the white guitar I was just holding. And we added rosewood rails, koa wings, glued some pieces onto the headstock to change the style and shape of the headstock. We added a rosewood head veneer and a bound ebony fingerboard with the cloud inlays. Not really the same guitar though, is it? You cut a guitar into a plank and then built a guitar around that plank. But it wasn't the conversions that annoyed the BC Rich fans. It was the body blank story. Ed claims that he bought body blanks from the BC Rich factories on two different occasions. I bought out a lot of factories. Uh, I bought out the BC Rich factory, uh, actually twice, when uh, Bernie sold the, bu the business to uh, uh, those people in New Jersey back in 1987, maybe. 
uh, he, the people didn't have enough money to buy all the inventory. They bought the name and the rights to the name, but I bought all the inventory. Body blanks are just unfinished guitars. They weren't painted or some of them were routed, some of them weren't. Now Ed's story changes a little bit depending on when he said it and the timelines don't always match up. In some cases he says that he bought the BC Rich Company, in other cases he just bought out the stock of a factory, and I'm more inclined to believe that he bought stock from a factory shutdown because BC Rich did shut down a couple of times in their history, whereas there's no evidence apart from Ed saying it that he owned BC Rich. In the early 90s, Ed purchased the ailing BC Rich company. Ed produced USA made neck through BC Rich body guitars for the period of five years under his own name. Then Bernie Rico Sr. offered Ed the entire company, but the catch was Ed would have to import low cost Chinese models. He didn't want to do that. Now the BC Rich story is kind of hard to verify. The Ed Roman story itself is hard to verify because it kind of changes depending on when he said it and the dates don't always line up with other things. But as far as I can piece together, Ed bought some BC Rich body cores, which were unfinished BC Riches. He'd finish them up and sell them as BC Riches, and he was doing so many that he actually put the licensed BC Rich manufacturer out of business. So I had all this inventory and I was out selling it. And of course, because I was selling the inventory, I bought it for so cheap, the guy who bought the name couldn't compete with me because I had the product and I had the price. So he ended up going out of business and he called me one morning and said, uh, I'm closing. And I, I, he said, can you get here today with cash? And I, I was there that day with cash. And I bought, I bought that whole place out for four cents on the dollar, if, I, if that. However, there are some discrepancies in the story. Neil Moser is a famous name in BC Rich history and he talked a little bit about it and I'm going to read out what he said. It was on a BC Rich Facebook group. All these body blanks you saw laying around in Ed's store that he was telling people were original old body blanks is major BS. There were very few original blanks from my era, 74 to 85, and probably fewer from the Class Axe era, 89 to 93. Class Axe didn't even have a neck through shop until at least 91. The only blanks I know of from that period came from my era, came from TJ. That's a time in BC Rich history when they were doing so well that the custom shop in the US couldn't keep up with orders, so they ordered body blanks from a shop in Mexico that would then ship the guitars to the custom shop in the US to finish. One of my jobs was to look over the guitars that came from TJ, BC South. I would check them all out to make sure they were viable. If there was a neck problem, they got pulled and put in a room at BC Rich. Theoretically, they were eventually supposed to be fixed, but it never happened. Finally, they built up to approximately 300 units. One day, Bernie checked out the room and decided he wanted to sell all the blanks. At the time, Wayne Charvel was working with Bernie, trying to get the ST3 pin router shop up and running. Anyway, Bernie asked Wayne if he knew of someone who might buy the body blanks. Wayne knew just the guy. Wayne and Lee Garver had been friends for some time. Wayne called Lee and Lee bought all 300 of the body blanks. I know this to be fact because I personally saw the receipt. Moving on, the amount of body blanks that Roman had was impossible. There were not that many ever made. I've also seen the blanks that Roman had and they were not made the way BC Ridge blanks were. These guitars were all made at the Roman shop. I've also never heard from any source that I know is legit that Roman was ever a builder for BC Rich. I asked HHI once, at the time HHI was Hanser Music Group and they owned the BC Rich license, why they didn't shut him down. And the answer was, we know he's building, but we can't prove it. Also, my guess is that Roman was one of their biggest dealers, so they didn't want to screw that up. Roman would buy one BC Rich and then build three using the same serial number. I could go on and on about this. So that's a statement coming from a guy who had history working in the custom shop. There's a section on Ed Roman's website about the discontinued models that he made, or doesn't make anymore, and he talks about BC Rich in it. Most of the BC Rich guitars that we have built, see above, have all been made from the original BC Rich body cores. The original serial numbers are still on the guitar. If there is no serial number, it's usually something we created for someone per their exact order. We also have retopped and rebuilt over 300 BC Rich guitars. Most of them are built from body cores, but not all of them because the others were fake. We have never represented one of ours to be a factory BC Rich. The logo is different and the headstock does not have the familiar BC Rich tit on the top. What he's referring to is the headstock that looks like this. This picture here may have a convenient crop because here's what that guitar's headstock looks like. 
We have estimated that we have built or rebuilt slightly more than 2,000 BC Rich or BC Rich style guitars during a period of 17 years. During most of that time, we were also a very large BC Rich dealer, excepting for a short period of time when we had been the largest BC Rich dealer in the world. We've chosen to no longer offer these guitars because it might cause confusion in the marketplace, and because David Enhancer, HHI, has asked us to stop making them. And here's the real problem about all this. If you bought them from Ed, you know, maybe you knew that they were not real. Maybe you didn't. Uh, some people didn't. But then when they get resold, you'll find guitars like this rare BC Rich Tony Iommi SG styled Ed Roman guitar. It's an SG shape BC Rich that uh, he bought from Ed Roman. So I'm not saying that it's fake. It's just that, according to Ed, there were only five made and three of which were for Tony and two got away. This might be one of the two that got away or it was one of the ones that he made. I can't seem to see a serial number on that guitar. That's not the only example. You can just search up Ed Roman BC Rich on Reverb and you'll find people who are listing them properly as Ed Roman BC Riches. And uh, apparently, according to a lot of people, they play quite well, but they're not real BC Riches. So they shouldn't be sold as that. And remember, there's like 2,000 of these out there, so if you're in that market, be wary of that. The same with the Gibsons, the same with the PRSs, and the vintage guitars that he'd either replace the body or the neck of, or most of the guitar. Now I want to be clear here, I'm talking about the old Ed Roman company. Since Ed Roman passed away, the Roman guitar shop is under different management and they don't seem to be doing any of the stuff that Ed Roman used to do. So that's the video. Be careful on the secondhand market. That should be the main takeaway. You don't want to end up with a fake. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Look after your broom.